The transgender issue has quickly become one that has captured our national attention. I often wonder, when did this start and where does it come from? Today, we have Kara Dansky, the author of The Abolition of Sex, How the Transgender Agenda Harms Women and Girls, here to join us to answer some of these questions. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. the show where I talk about timeless, eternal subjects. For those of you who want to see the news portion of the show, be, be sure to check out the Julie Noted playlist on this channel. Also, just as a reminder, my show with Dennis Prager, Dennis and Julie, is now officially premiering on this channel every Monday. Now, one of the more timely topics of our time is certainly this transgender issue. But what is timeless is the essence of womanhood, which has really come under assault in recent years. Here I have an expert on the transgender issue to uh, join me on the show. This is Kara Dansky. She is the president of the US chapter of Women's Declaration International, which seeks to promote the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights. She also served on the board of the Women's Liberation Front from 2016 to 2020. And as I indicated in the introduction, she is the author of the fabulous book, The Abolition of Sex, How the Transgender Agenda Harms Women and Girls. Kara, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So to start off, this is clearly a niche issue to get into. How did you become interested in slash an expert on transgenderism? So that's a really interesting question. I spent most of my career in what is commonly referred to as the progressive criminal justice reform community. I'm a lawyer, I was a public defender. I come from the political left and I worked at the ACLU from 2012 until 2014. And I left the ACLU for personal reasons to do another job in criminal justice. And at around that time, at the end of 2014, Someone told me that this whole question of transgender or gender identity is really dangerous for women and girls. And in addition to my paid work in the criminal justice movement, I've also always been a feminist and I've been active in a lot of feminist causes. And so that really concerned me. So I joined the Women's Liberation Front in 2015. As you said, I served on the board from 2016 to 2020, and that really immersed me in a lot of the politics of all of this and the importance of protecting women and girls as a category in the law. I don't know how much you wanna get into my personal history, but the, the more specific answer to your question about how did I even get involved in this is that my activism in protecting women and girls from the harms of gender identity eventually got me canceled from my career in criminal justice. So I kind of ended up being propelled into doing this work full time. Well, I absolutely want to hear about that. What happened? So in early 2019, I was working at a criminal justice agency in Washington, D.C. on criminal justice stuff. It had nothing to do with this. But at that time, I was on my own time volunteering on the board of Women's Liberation Front, and we held a panel at the Heritage Foundation, which was interesting because we are on the political left, we're radical feminists, and we wanted to hold a panel explaining the feminist leftist critique of gender identity. And we did everything we could to get a panel on one of the more left-leaning or libertarian-leaning think tanks in DC, and none of them would have us. To their credit, Heritage would have us. And so we did the panel, it was called the Inequality of the Equality Act Concerns from the Left. And I did that on my own time during non-work hours. And when I went to work the following week, someone, and I don't know who, had complained to a member of the DC City Council about why was there a TERF serving in the agency. We can talk about what that means. 
And my boss was very taken aback by this. It was very confusing to her because she was not very familiar with the topic. She's a very politically middle of the road, probably conservative leaning um, woman. And she didn't understand what was happening. And she asked me to explain what it was. And I said, well, this is women's rights advocacy that I should be able to do during my non-work hours. And over the course of the, the next year, throughout 2019, it just became untenable. Uh, she received email after email of people on the internet demanding to know why is there a turf serving on this agency? And by the end of 2019, it just wasn't workable. I could either keep my job and shut up about women's rights, or I could quit my job and do women's rights full time. And that's what I elected to do. Wow. It's fascinating that you started this interview off by saying that you were coming at this from the political left because people think that this opposition to the so-called gender affirming surgery is really just a right wing issue. And of course, those on the right are the most vociferous opponents of such a thing. But this really shouldn't be a left or right issue. This is an eternal issue. And especially if, if one is a feminist, certainly we should be trying to combat the elimination of womanhood. So you mentioned, Kara, you said that you and your group were radical feminists. What do you mean by that? What, what does it mean to be a, quote, radical feminist? So for us, the word radical comes from the Latin, meaning getting at the root. And so from our perspective, the root of the problem is what we would refer to as male domination in society, male domination of power in particular in society. And so we view that as the root of the problem that women and girls face. Okay. So let's talk about your book, The Abolition of Sex. For my, so my co-host and friend, Dennis Prager, who I do a show with, he was famously on Bill Maher, I think it was in 2019, and he made this uh, statement where he said that uh, there's an increasing contingent of those on the left who say that men can menstruate. And the audience laughed, including Bill Maher. They thought it was such a preposterous thing. They thought Dennis was making it up. To say America okay. is anti-Semitic is right. a lie. To say it is racist is a lie. Okay. These well, are we're, giant left-wing lies. Well, we're talking about degrees. To say that men can menstruate is a lie. And that is now, that is what is said. <laughs> wait, 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 where did that I, I never, never heard it. You never heard it, right, okay. Check it out, folks. Check it out. <laughs> I think, I think Anyone who says wrong. a man wait, wait, cannot wait, wait, menstruate wait, is considered transphobic. I, I, I missed this whole story. You, you did. I did. I I tell, you no, did. tell me where, so where, where are you it. getting this? Just Google it. Can men menstruate? Who, who is saying this? You're who talking about saying a very it? small no, percentage. Oh, really? Then how do you allow men, biological men, to run against women in, in the races in Connecticut and set all the high oh, school oh, records? Okay. I, but that's oh, they're, they're called men. No, no, the Nation see, magazine I wouldn't, said they're, they're, okay, they're women. Okay, but I would agree with you on that. The way you frame it is nonsense. Well, no, I framed it perfectly accurately. No, 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 you didn't. And so here we are, three and a half years later, in 2023, and if you deny that statement, then you're a bigot. How did this change so fast? Can you explain to us where did this transgender movement come from and how has it proliferated with such rapidity? You know, it's interesting that you mentioned Mr. Prager's appearance on Bill Maher. People in my community, radical feminists and our male allies are very familiar with that interview. And we were cheering him on because he was mm. absolutely right when he said that on Bill Maher. And it was very frustrating to many of us that, as you said, the audience laughed and Bill Maher laughed at him and said, oh, Dennis, you're being ridiculous. I think Bill Maher actually said, Dennis, you're being ridiculous. Um, and you're right, that has all come to be true. People do say that today. People say it on the floor of Congress. I think what a lot of people don't understand is that there are rank and file Democrats and many former Democrats all over this country who reach out to me all the time. And they're absolutely appalled with what the Democratic Party is doing on this topic. And the reason that most people don't know that is that we can never get a voice in the media. As you said, most mainstream media outlets always paint this dispute as being on the so-called, you know, big, bad Christian right. I'm using those words ironically and a quote, small marginalized community over here. But that's not what's happening at all. This so-called small marginalized community, and this gets to the answer of your question, is actually being driven by a massive industry. There's, there are billions of dollars behind what I refer to in my book as the transgender agenda. This is not a grassroots civil rights movement. This is a very top-down 
industry-driven, pharma-driven, medical supply industry-driven uh, movement to obliterate the material reality of sex. Now, you could be forgiven for not knowing that because most people don't talk about it. It's always framed as, as the president likes to say, the civil rights movement of our time. But that is not true. That is not what's happening. It, Americans across the political spectrum have been lied to for the last several years, at least since 2016, although most of us didn't know it because we didn't know what the Obama administration was doing. I could talk about that if you'd like. But certainly since 2021, the day that President Biden took office, he signed an executive order, 13988, that announced for the first time that the word sex was going to be redefined to include gender identity throughout all of U.S. federal administrative law. And the administration has continued to push that. Now, the whole transgender movement goes back much further than that. And I talk in my book about so-called queer theory, which was prevalent in U.S. institutions and other institutions in the 1960s and 70s. And that basically pushed the idea that sex isn't real. It, it pushed the idea that a lot of things aren't real. But for our purposes, the, its point was that sex isn't real. But if a bunch of weirdo academics in the ivory tower tried to persuade ordinary Americans that sex isn't real, they would have failed spectacularly. So they made up this word transgender. It's a much nicer sounding word then we're going to try to convince all of you that nobody knows how babies are made because that would be preposterous. Americans would have rejected that. So they made up this whole concept that there is a transgender civil rights movement and the Democratic Party and all of our institutions, all of our academic institutions, our business institutions, um, you know, major uh, media outlets, you know, including Netflix and Amazon, all of them have largely persuaded Americans across the political spectrum that there's some category of people called transgender, when in reality, all 8 billion of us, every single human being on the face of the planet is either female or male, including the people who call themselves transgender. Mm. Was that too much? No, no, not at all. I, I want to zoom in on what you said actually at the beginning of that answer, you're talking about ph big pharma. Because what's fascinating to contemplate here is who stands to benefit. You very eloquently outlined how the, the Democratic Party and specifically the professorial intellectual crowd is sort of behind this movement. But can you please talk more about the, the pharmaceutical industry and how they are pushing this transgenderism? Just from a common sense perspective, it makes total sense that if you yeah. want to make a lot of money and if you're big pharma, you put an entire generation's worth of children on hormones that they will have to take for the rest of their lives. So you can see it when you think about that, it makes complete sense. In addition, you, we can also document, and it has been documented, that the pharmaceutical industry is funding organizations like the Human Rights Campaign, which, is, which had its origins in fighting for lesbians and gay men and changed course radically thereafter. Um, Pharma is funding something called WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, which pushes, uh, you know, completely experimental procedures on minors and adults. Uh, it funds the Endocrine Society. So you can see this. And I can say that I will have another book coming out later this year uh, that will be on a slightly different topic, but will go into these issues in much more detail. And I have found uh, in part through relying on the amazing research of my friend Jennifer Billick, who runs the 11th hour blog, all of this can be documented. Sometimes when those of us in, in our position talk about this stuff, it sounds as though we're a bit conspiratorial. It sounds as though we're a bit crazy. I understand that. The problem though, is that it can all be documented and has been documented and will continue to be documented. We're not making it up, I promise. One of the things that I learned from your book, Kara, and also from Abigail Schreier's book, who, as you know, is another uh, 
titan, intellectual titan in, in this uh, realm, is that the, the, the majority of youth transgenders are those who were born biologically as women and then transition to become men. I have even seen this in my own anecdotal experience in my life, in my high school and in college, it was almost always overwhelmingly girls going to boys. I have sort of a psychological theory that I'd like to, to run past you to, to see if you might agree with it. I think that the reason for that is, well, of course, I, you know, women are sort of more of a proclivity to let their emotions sort of rule over them and maybe they, they sort of are emotionally influenced by this transgender movement. That could be one reason. I think there's actually a deeper psychological reason that women resent the hardships that come with being women. They think that men have it easier. And of course, in many ways, men do have it easier. It is uh, you know, unfair that, that we have to suffer through periods, whereas men don't. We have to suffer through childbirth, as, as men don't. We get catcalled on the street, which is not fun, and men don't. And in many ways, of course, there are certain things about life that make it easier to be a man. I think that is why so many girls are becoming boys, because it's this deeper psychological resentment of the hardships that come with womanhood. What, how would you assess my, my hypothesis? Yeah, so I'm definitely not going along with your hypothesis that women are more emotional than men. Oh. That would be a very anti-feminist position to take. But setting that aside, um, yes, and it can, that can be documented as well. I have heard from young woman after young woman after young woman. Uh, these are young women who have decided they've made a mistake. And so they, they detransition. We can talk a little bit about that. But these women talk about how uncomfortable they are with puberty, how uncomfortable they are with the ways in which they're being looked at by boys in their schools and by men on the street. And, you know, I can say that I'm growing up when I did, it was bad enough to be a girl growing into a woman in my late teenage years and throughout my 20s. It was hard enough being you know, relentlessly exposed to images of the ideal woman on magazines in the checkout aisle at the store and told that if I didn't have a certain body weight, that I was unattractive and being ogled and catcalled, as you say, on the street, that was really hard. But it is infinitely harder for girls and young women today, in part because of pornography. And women and girls are saying that they feel really disgusted by the images that they see in pornography of the really brutal and violent ways in which women are treated. And they don't want that. They don't want that. They don't want to be, identify with that if that is what woman is. Hmm. And so they will say, I hate, I hated getting breasts. And so they'll go to a doctor and they'll take a puberty blocker and oftentimes go on testosterone and oftentimes have their breasts removed because they're so uncomfortable with the idea of being sexualized in our hypersexualized society. So I agree with you 100% that it's very difficult to be a young woman right now. And a lot of these young women will say exactly that. They did not want to grow into what they viewed as the hypersexualized version of womanhood that is expected of them today. And so they they did their best to quote, identify out of it mm -hmm. um, with just really heart-wrenching lifelong consequences. These girls will never get their breasts back. Many of them yes. will be infertile. I mean, it's just awful. I, I want to zoom in just quickly on our respectful area of, of disagreement. Why do you think it's anti-feminist to, to say that women tend to be more ruled by their emotions than men. My, my argument is that actually that's one of the, the distinctions between men and women, and it can be both a good thing and a bad thing. I think one of the things that makes women different from men in a good way is that we are more empathetic and we are sort of more uh, attuned to, to one's emotions, but that it can also have an Achilles heel where that we can be ruled sometimes by our emotions. So I'm just curious, as we're talking about this, these distinctions and you know, the importance of womanhood, why, why is that an anti-feminist thing to say? So the feminist argument against that would be that there's nothing about femaleness that makes us naturally inclined toward more being more emotional or being more nurturing. But the feminist argument would be that all of those things are imposed by society. I don't, we don't have to 
argue about that or not. I'm just saying that's the feminist critique of what you're saying. And then another thing that feminists would say is that it's not that women are more emotional than men. It's that stereotypically women are differently emotional than men. So the kinds of things you're talking about in terms of women oftentimes being more comfortable crying, oftentimes more comfortable being in touch with our emotions. I think that that's true. Uh, but I don't think it's natural. I think it's societally imposed. But when we say that women are more, more emotional than men, it kind of ignores the ways in which men can often be extremely emotional. You know, you'll see arguments. Um, in other words, like men oftentimes tend to be more inclined toward anger. That's an emotion. When a when a man, you know, when you see a man raging at another man or at a woman, that's because he doesn't have his emotions in check and he's not able to say, okay. I am sitting here with anger, I'm feeling anger, and I need to process that anger in an appropriate way. Instead, he just lashes out. And we see this in all aspects of society. So my point of that is not to bash men at all. It's just to say that I don't think it's that women are more emotional. I think that it's that we tend to be differently emotional. So I'm pursuing this area of disagreement because I actually think it is so relevant to this conversation of transgenderism. So when you say that, you know, the, the differences, I guess, in emotion between men and women are imposed by society. That to me is sort of, and, and I of course want to, want to hear your response and, and your challenge to me, that argument to me is sort of lending legitimacy to the transgender movement, which says that there is nothing inherently different about men and women. It's all societally imposed. As you were saying earlier in this conversation, you know, the, the gender is a construct or there's no such thing as gender. I think w when the argument is made that, that the, these, um, these emotional distinctions are just imposed by society, that kind of, uh, to me at least, dismisses the fact that there are some, some immutable differences between men and women that go beyond just societal labels. Does that make sense? So whether there are immutable personality differences between women and men, a radical feminist would say, no, there are not immutable personality differences between women as a class and men as a class. But that is not to deny that there are clearly physiological differences between women and men. So to say, to, to acknowledge as radical feminists do, that there are physiological differences between women and men is not to say that therefore there are immutable personality traits that apply to women as a class, as opposed to men as a class. Mm -hmm. Well, for you know, so it's interesting because feminists often get accused of being behind this whole transgender thing for the reason you just said, but it's really not true. Feminists were never saying that there are no differences between women and men. We just maintained, not we, I wasn't there during the second wave in the 60s, but feminists during that time weren't saying there's literally no physiological differences between women and men. And they weren't saying that men can become women or that women can become men. Quite the opposite. Radical feminists in the 1970s in particular were very concerned about the whole transsexual movement, which became transgenderism. Um, but in any event, Radical feminists would not maintain that there are no differences at all between women and men, just right. that they're physiological. Right. I maintain that the, I guess, the emotional part um, that can more dominate women and also on the, the other side, the more sort of violent sexual nature that can dominate men. I think those are sort of offshoots of the physiological differences. At least that's that's my perspective. But I but I take your point. So. I've been so eager to ask you this question since I, I read your book because it's something that I really sort of um, struggle with, honestly, myself uh, pertaining to transgenderism. I remember back in 2015, I think it was, when Caitlyn Jenner transitioned. Uh, she gave the, the famous interview to Diane Sawyer where then Bruce was talking about how for all of his life he really believed he, he was a woman. He, you know, it was just, it was so devastating to, to see. And it would, that was my first, I was 15 years old, that was my first introduction to transgenderism. And I remember seeing, you know, the images of him running at the Olympics and he said he was trying to assert his masculinity when he really felt like he was feminine. And I felt such overwhelming compassion for him. I thought, my God, it must be so difficult to live your life feeling like you don't belong in your body. And so 
I struggle with this because I, I at least do believe, and this is my own subjective anecdotal observation, I do believe that there is a very, very small contingent of the population that truly is transgender, just as there are, there's a very small portion of the population that are Siamese twins. I mean, it's it just, there are different, you know, um, conditions, if you will, that, that happen to, to a small segment of the population. But obviously what we're seeing now is social contagion. Would you agree that there are some individuals, a small portion who truly are transgender? So in order to answer that question, I have to ask you, what do you mean by people who are transgender? What is that category of people to you? To me, it is individuals who are truly plagued by gender dysphoria, who real like who who really are, were born with that as a di just as someone who was born with bipolar or schizophrenia is, is truly born with gender dysphoria. S someone like Caitlyn Jenner, for instance, I think really was born with that with, with gender dysphoria. I don't, you know, Caitlyn Jenner is obviously biologically a man, but but I think she truly has that that. Um, that gender dysphoria, whereas the individuals or the teenagers that we're seeing today, I don't think they have the gender dysphoria. I think they have the social contagion of thinking they have gender dysphoria. What does it mean to be born with gender dysphoria? Well, I think that just as you are sort of born with ge genetic proclivities to be depressed or to be schizophrenic, I think it's I think it's a, a mental illness or a uh, a sort of physiological part of you that you are born with. A diagnosable okay. trait. Okay, so you're saying it's a diagnosable mental illness, but, but things like depression and schizophrenia aren't diagnosed in infants. Well, they're diagnosed later, but I believe that certain individuals are born with certain ill even well i'll give an example autism is one autism is something that maybe you're diagnosed later but you are born with i view gender dysphoria as similar to that okay so if gender is dysphoria is a sincere belief that one actually is the opposite sex is that is that sort of a working definition yes okay or so one fe feels v misaligned with with their with their genitalia so how is that possible in infancy? I look, I'm telling you, it's my subjective anecdotal sort of observation and I'm willing to be challenged on it. It's not my, you know, be all end all point of view, but it's, I, I do think that there are some members of the population who really do struggle with it genuinely. Um, I don't, I don't doubt for the social contagion. I don't doubt for a second that there are people who really struggle with this. And again, I'm I'm getting my information from people who fall into the category of detransitioners. Whether we're talking about women or men, these are people who talk very sincerely, and I don't question them at all, about how deeply distressed they were at the thought of themselves as being the sex that they are. It it it's it is. It's psychological anguish for people who go through this. I under I don't I don't question their sincerity. It's just that I have never seen any credible scientific evidence to suggest that anyone has ever been born in the wrong body or that anyone has ever changed sex or that it's possible to change sex. So is gender dysphoria different than something like autism where, you know, it, so you're saying it's it's sort of a developed mental illness rather than something that you are genetically born with? or genetically perhaps is the wrong word, but you are at, at birth or very early in life, it's something that afflicts you. You're saying gender dysphoria is something that you, is an illness that you sort of learn, because according to the, I think it's the DSM-5, which is the Psychiatric Association, you know, mental illnesses, obviously it lists one of them. It doesn't say whether or not it is sort of developed socially. It's listed alongside things like autism that one is sort of born with, if you will. Yeah, so, my understanding is that there's no credible scientific evidence to support the idea that it's something one can be born with. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that even if that were not true, it is still the case that every single infant that's born is even before birth, you can test in utero. Every single infant is either female or male. 
every single one of us. And so the people who eventually start to complain that they're feeling incongruence with their sex still are either female or male. And I agree with you that it, again, I, I understand it to be a debilitating condition to sincerely believe that one is either the opposite sex or somehow no sex or both sexes. Right. Um, I'm sure that that is a, a terrible state of affairs mentally. But, but even given that, literally 100% of infants that are born are either female or male. And that includes the category of people who are born with legitimate conditions of uh, disorders of sexual development, which is more commonly referred to as intersex. These are the 0.02% of the population of people who vary from the typical XX or XY. Those are medical conditions that definitely do exist. Um, but that has nothing to do with so-called gender dysphoria. Right. As far as I know. Okay. So when, so when someone like, for instance, you know, Caitlyn Jenner, I'm going back to that, that Diane Sawyer interview, when, when she was saying when, when she was, re, you know, three or four or five years old, she started to feel like she wasn't in the right body. You're saying that is an illness that has developed at that age uh, rather than something, again, like autism or depression or schizophrenia or bipolar that is sort of born in you. You're saying that someone who's maybe three, I mean, of course, in today's society, someone three, four or five years old, it could be because there's a drag queen twerking in front of them at their school. But someone like Caitlyn Jenner, who grew up pro probably in the 50s, 60s, uh, when when she in a, in a different environment is feeling that at a very young age, are, are you saying and I'm and I'm asking it genuinely. I'm not disagreeing. I'm truly trying to understand. Are you saying that it's it's developed? Well, on what basis would Jenner or anyone else feel that? Right. So the feminist critique of all of this is to say that we live in a society that has very rigid sex role stereotypes, which we would refer to as gender. Mm -hmm. For, from a feminist perspective, that's what gender is. It's sex role stereotypes. And most of us don't completely align with either of them, but they are very rigid and they were even more rigid in the 1950s. So if Jenner was feeling that he wasn't somehow male, mm -hmm. that could only be on the basis that he didn't feel like he fit into society's box that society put him in, which is, you know, the blue box, the stereotypically male box. Um, I, I don't know exactly what traits he was referring to that he sort of felt he identified with. You probably remember better than I do. I don't know if he said he felt more nurturing or he felt something like that, that he associated with femininity made him think, oh, I must be a girl. Mm. But from a feminist standpoint, that's all very sexist. You know, we've seen over and over again, we'll see people who say, um, you know, when I was little, I loved to play with my mom's wardrobe and I loved to put on her high heels and I loved to put on makeup. Therefore, I'm female. From a feminist perspective, that in itself is totally sexist. The idea that women are people who wear dresses and high heels and makeup, um, that's that's the girl box. That's sexist stereotyping. That's so. So so how is that sexist stereotyping if it's what is usually understood or what, what sort of how you observe women to to dress and act and behave? How can it how can it be a stereotype if it's an observed reality? I mean, my argument would be it's an observed reality because it's forced upon women and girls as a sex class. Um, high heels are very harmful. <laughs> they cause a lot of damage to our feet and our legs and our back. Um, and, and we're told that we sort of have to do these things if we're going to conform to society's expectations of what women and girls are supposed to look like and act like and do. So to ask the Matt Walsh question <laughs> or the question that the, the Senate people were asking Katanji Brown Jackson, what is a woman? A woman is an adult human female. And I just want to say Matt Walsh did not invent that question. It's the No, of course he didn't, but he's he's got he's been famous for it. So you're saying that the the only distinctions between men and women are the the genitalia. No, not at all. I mean, it's not just about genitalia. We have physiologically different bodies. But the but when you're talking about the the high heels and the dress and the makeup, you're saying that is 
being societally pushed upon women rather than something that they have a natural proclivity to want to engage in? Do you think, do you think women have a natural proclivity to want to engage in, in, I guess, beauty activities, if you will, like makeup, hair, fashion, or do you think those things are forced upon by society? As a class, they're forced upon us by society, but do individual women enjoy playing with fashion and makeup and hair? Sure. Mm. So as a final note, how do you see this ending? This has come, this, this transgender movement has come to infect every area of society. It's been really astonishing. I'm sure you're aware of the uh, public school education codes, whether it's in Arizona, New Jersey, Oregon, talking about punishing certain teachers, school districts, if they don't conform to this. How, how do you see this getting any better? Well, there's a lot of work to do. So my organization worked very hard to advance the protection of women and girls in Sports Act, which passed in the U.S. House last Thursday. And we're working very hard to see if we can advance it in the U.S. Senate going forward. We work uh, in the courts. We're working currently on some briefs that will be filed in federal appellate courts to allow states and schools to maintain sex specific bathrooms and sports. There's a lot of work to be done at the local level. I know that parents are increasingly speaking out about the topics you're talking about with respect to schools. Parents are going to their school board meetings and complaining about mixed sex bathrooms. Parents are going to school board meetings and complaining about the curriculum that their children are being taught, that anyone can be either a boy or a girl. And I'm so happy to see those parents get really actively involved at the local level, because those of us who do this kind of legal and policy advocacy, mostly at the state and federal levels, we can't be everywhere. And it's really the parents whose voices are some of the most important, you know, and I just want to say, especially to the parents whose children are struggling with this, I dedicated my first book to them. And I just have nothing but compassion for the parents who are watching an industry destroy their children's bodies and lives. Um, I think it's terrible. But but also the parents who are not struggling with this uh, are really showing up and saying, no, don't do the, Don't teach my kid that sex isn't real. Don't teach my kid that anyone can be either a girl or a boy. Um, and it's really great that they're doing it. And I hope parents continue to do it because it's really important work. School boards need to hear from you parents at the local level. Well, God bless you. It is especially brave coming at this from the left, the way that the, the left uh, silences and vilifies people who speak out against this. This is Kara Dansky. She's the author of The Abolition of Sex, How the Transgender Agenda Harms Women and Girls. Thanks so much again for coming on. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for joining us today. You know, Kara just said to me when we, we uh, clicked off for that interview, she said, you know, I love that we are able to disagree with one another because we don't see that nowadays. It's so difficult for people to disagree with one another respectfully. And I just said to my producers, and I wanted to say it to you, what was so fun and interesting to me about that interview is at different times, I was the righty and she was the lefty w with regard to like uh, stereotypes, for instance, she's saying, High heels are a gender construct. I'm saying no. And then at other times, I was sort of the lefty and she was the righty. I was saying, well, aren't you sort of born with gender dysphoria in some cases like depression? And she was saying no. So that is just a sign of a really good discussion that you can sort of switch sides, if you will, and come at it from different angles and disagree. But it's a very complicated subject and one that we do not have clear answers to. That is for sure, except for the fact that this should not be forced upon children, which clearly we both very strongly agree on. Thanks so much again for joining us. And remember that each of our thoughts, choices, and actions shape who we are. So let's think clearly, choose wisely, and act with principle and determination. Take care. <laughs>